Hey guys, welcome back. Mr. Shaw here. Just wanted to make a quick video for you uh, covering learning objective uh, 3.2. Uh, we're going to talk about the uh, acquiring new lands. We're going to talk about Teddy Roosevelt's, um, his his role in, in imperialism, Woodrow Wilson as well. Uh, to be honest with you, Woodrow Wilson isn't really uh, tested it very much in this unit, but I wanted to still kind of give you some background on what was going on right going right up into World War I, which is what we'll cover next week. Uh, so let's get to it. So last week we talked about um, all of the different uh, territories that were, were getting acquired uh, by the United States and, you know, kind of why why we were doing it and, you know, kind of just where where we were going to go from here, why we needed those things. Um, so let's let's kind of figure out where the story takes off. So we, we had just acquired Puerto Rico um, from Spain in the Spanish-American War as part of the Treaty of Paris. Uh, people were kind of split on, on independence in Puerto Rico. They, they didn't know if they wanted statehood. They don't, didn't know if they wanted to be a, a state in, a, in America um, or they wanted to be independent or they wanted to be self-governing under the United States. So the United States gave Puerto Ricans no guarantees about statehood or independence. Um, what ended up happening was that they go, they actually end up being self-governed under the United States rule. Um, the during mil, the during the Spanish American War, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, General Nelson A. Miles occupies the occupied that island again. I'm not worried about the name. Um, Puerto Rico was under military control. Um, however, uh, after the Spanish American War, um, they are kind of going back to normal. So, the Port Puerto Rico as a, as an island is really important as a as a uh, strategic like naval base as, as just a, a, a holding area uh, on the way to Cuba, on the way to you know if you wanted to go to South America. So uh, we wanted to make sure that we uh, we were taking advantage of it. So in 1900, they set up the Foraker Act, which is going to set up a civil government, which is going to allow the president to appoint the governor and also the upper house of their legislature. And that's so again, it's not like so to be clear, like we're not really into the statehood um, debate yet. Like they like they didn't really they still didn't know what they wanted to do. So until they figured it out, the president was going to take over and make sure to uh, help them decide that or make sure that the government was still functioning adequately. Uh, so in 1917, uh, or actually a little bit before that, the Supreme Court had some some cases come before them called the Insular Cases, and in those cases, the Supreme Court ruled that citizen citizenship is not automatically granted to uh, people who are in acquired territories. Therefore, Congress specifically has to grant people citizenship in those territories that they acquire. Uh, and that's exactly what they did. So again, 17 years later, after the Foraker Act, uh, Puerto Ricans are, are going to be made U.S. citizens, um, and they are now al allowed to elect both houses. Uh, and then, but again, the president would still elect or appoint the governor of Puerto Rico. Uh, so there you go. They're, they're finally citizens. Uh, even today, Puerto Ricans are still citizens. However, they do not get an, uh, a, a say in the presidential election. They actually can elect their own congressmen, but those congressmen can't vote in Congress. So are they really congressmen at all? I don't know. Uh, anyway, so that's Puerto Rico. So next up is Cuba, and so Cuba is really important because they are the thing that we don't get. A lot of people wanted Cuba. They wanted Cuba to be a state. A lot of people still want Cuba to be a state, to be honest with you. So um, when after the at the end of the Spanish-American War, the United States recognizes Cuban independence from Spain, and they have the uh, the Teller Amendment says that U.S. has no intention of taking over Cuba, meaning that they are going to be a free and independent nation. However, that really doesn't happen. So after the war, the United States troops are going to still occupy uh, Cuba. They are going to basically they're going to use the same officials that Spain had. Uh, the, anybody who is protesting is going to be in prison or exiled. So first of all, the things I'm saying, like, it doesn't really sound very free and independent. That's because it wasn't. Uh, or at least it wasn't that different from Spanish rule. Again, you have the same people ruling over you. Um, and you, and again, you still have a, a, a bigger, higher power, not higher power, more powerful country that is kind of calling the shots and running your country. So but but again, in that case, the um, the American military was uh, was helping the government to rebuild the country. Um, so we said at least that, that we had a, a a much better purpose than just you know maintaining you know maintaining Cuba as as a quote unquote territory. Um, the thing that we that is really important to know is the Platt Amendment, and that was um, 
uh, not quite a part of the Treaty of Paris, but we had them add this into their constitution. And uh, like this was in 1901, and there was three major things. First thing, it says that the U.S. can in intervene in Cuban affairs. Second thing, Guantanamo Bay is going to be leased to the United States as a naval base. And then Cuba cannot enter into agreements with other nations. So that's not at all free and independent. So we, yes, we, we were fighting this war for Cuban independence. However, what we have at the end, what we have at the end is something that's not really resembling independence at all. Uh, so this is what, again, you need to know that uh, Cuba is going to become a protectorate, um, which, the, again, and I didn't have the definition there, but if you want to write it, uh, it is literally a, a smaller country being, or a smaller or weaker, weaker country being protected uh, or being looked looked after by a more powerful one. So it's kind of like imperialism, uh, like the definition of imperialism uh, just added into a new word. <clears throat> All right, so let's get into um, to the Philippines. So the Philippines in the Spanish American War, they participated, um, in the, in the war, thinking specifically that the United States was going to also grant them independence. They're like, Hey, they're fighting Spanish or for, or for Cuban independence. Maybe they'll do the same thing for us if we help them out. And that didn't happen. The Philippines were a really, really important, like, um, like group of islands strategically. So we were like, well, we, these are just awesome. Like we're going to buy these. So, and, and then we, and that is, it was an actual territory still. They actually do have, in 1946, um, they do become uh, independent, but we kept them for almost 45 years after they were, after we had, had, you know, stopped fighting Spain. Anyway, so uh, they were outraged at the Treaty of Paris that called for the annexation of uh, of the Philippines. Uh, a guy by the name of Emilio Aguinaldo leads uh, the rebels in the fight for independence. Specifically, he is he was the guy that encouraged people to help out the United States um, in the Spanish American War. And now he's like, hey, you didn't give us what you what we thought you would. So now you're gonna, we're going to fight against you, which leads us to the Philippine American War uh, from 1899 to 1902. <clears throat> uh, so the U.S. forces, um, they actually force Filipinos to live in designated zones, which are re in really poor conditions. Sounds a lot like, you know, concentration camps or internment camps, maybe not quite concentration camps. Like that's, that's dramatic. Um, but, uh, there were a lot of, like, a lot of race issues here. Though a lot of white soldiers, they saw the Filipinos as inferior. Again, getting back to that cultural superiority part of imperialism. Uh, there were black troops that were troubled at the spreading prejudices, um, that you, that they were seeing all, all around the Philippines. Uh, some black troops actually deserted. They, they went over and they, they joined the Filipinos, uh, because they were so appalled at what was happening and what some of the white soldiers were doing. And in this three-year period, 20,000 Filipinos are going to die uh, in the fight for independence. They are not given their independence. Um, the United, uh, the U.S. president is going to appoint a governor who appoints the upper house. Again, similar situation with Puerto Rico. Uh, the people are going to elect the, the lower house. Uh, uh, William Taft, uh, the, who is soon to be president, uh, he actually was the first governor of the Philippines. Uh, and anyway, as I mentioned, uh, in 45, about 45 years later or so, uh, the Philippines is finally going to become a free and independent country. Uh, so again, that is, that's a really tough call. Again, you, you, you kind of see the ugly side of imperialism here is that America needed something. They needed something from the Philippines, uh, and, they got it and that was it. They weren't, they weren't really worried about helping people, uh, in the Philippines maintain their independence. All right. So next up, uh, we're talking about China. So China is a, again, it, it was a big country then. It's still a big country today. It's even bigger today. So it's a vast potential market. It's got so many people, a lot of investment opportunities. So we're kind of late to the game though. France, Britain, Japan, and Russia all have settlements, um, in, China. These are called spheres of influence. Again, it would be good to know that. This is like um, kind of imagine like a piece of a pie and a sphere of influence is like you when, when a, a larger country literally controls a just a small part of a of a different country uh, or at least let me let me rephrase that a bigger country is going to control a uh, kind of a part of a weaker country. So in, with China, we don't control the whole country. However, we are kind of fighting to carve out a little piece of China for ourselves. Um, and that kind of starts with John Hayes open door notes. Um, wh and what we're going to do is we're going to say, Hey, um, listen, we're late to the party, but everybody should have free trade in, in China or free access to trade in China. Um, 
and and as it says here in the second bullet notes, the, the notes are going to ask imperialist nations to share trading rights of the United States. Uh, the other powers are going to reluctantly agree. There's not really a whole lot of incentive for them to do that because they're going to lose a little bit of their power. Uh, however, they do. They they go ahead and they agree. And uh, but at, at, you notice that in, nothing in that mentions the, the Chinese rights. That nothing in that mentioned what the Chinese people wanted. Uh, most likely, the Chinese didn't want uh, this kind of foreign influence because China has a long, rich history uh, of being a free and independent nation. So. One uh, p problem that pops up is the Boxer Rebellion. The Boxers were a, they were martial artists, um, that, martial artists rather, uh, that really didn't want the, all these foreign influences in China. So uh, the, the Boxers are going to try, like literally start fighting uh, foreigners uh, and it leads to the, what's known as the Boxers, Boxer Rebellion. They are going to kill hundreds of foreigners, um, a lot of uh, like, for, like foreigners or Chinese converts to Christianity. Uh, most people in China were Buddhist, and anybody who had converted to, to Christianity, they were a target too. And the United States, Britain, France, and Germany, and Japan are going to have to work together to put down the Boxer Rebellion. Uh, but again, you notice here that like, like the needs, the needs of the country that is being colonized or being imperialized, uh, really is not taking, taken into account. Um, so after this, uh, after we uh, put down the Boxer Rebellion, uh, we are going to think about how we're going to protect Americans' rights. So Hay, John Hay is going to issue a new Open Door Notes, um, and he, he's going to say that the United States will keep trade open with China and through with all the other nations as well. Uh, and the Open Door Policy, it's going to reflect the beliefs about the U.S. economy. Again, the United States, they have this, like, our Americans have this love of capitalism and uh, everything about it. And we're going to kind of see that come to life now, uh, because they want they want they want to make sure that uh, that in China that we can uh, grow the economy, that we can make it more powerful, uh, and that's going to depend on exports. Okay, so we the the United States uh, has the right to keep the markets open uh, because. If that, if they close, it's going to threaten economies all over the world. Uh, and then the closing of, of, of these areas could threaten the United States survival in, in China. Um, but also it does affect the Americans economy back home. Uh, last thing for, uh, the, for this first part, and then we'll get into a little bit more about, um, a little bit more about, um, excuse me. Uh, Woodrow Wilson uh, in the next part, uh, but we'll we'll finish up here. the uh, The impact, guys, of of these territorial gains is that we like what what we're th what we're thinking is that like President McKinley at the time he wasn't he was a kind of a reluctant imperial imperialist like he wasn't really big on taking other land and and taking other countries rights however he got reelected because this all this stuff the spanish american war uh all these like like the annexation of hawaii like stuff like that that's all happening under his reign and he gets reelected so we think anyway that most americans favored imperialism However, there's a lot of people that uh, are against it. They, uh, they call themselves the Anti-Imperialist League. And there's a lot of prominent people. Mark Twain uh, is going to be one of the main ones. Uh, Jane Adams of Hull House uh, are going to be another one. Uh, these people, are they are really against us um, work, you know, kind of because we're not – Yes, we're getting things that America needs. However, at the same time, we're really it's it's at the expense of other people's rights or other countries' rights uh, and freedoms, and they don't really approve of that because we just went through this whole progressive era trying to make sure that the citizens' rights were protected, people that the, the government was taking more of an interest in protecting the people, and then all of a sudden we turn around and it's the complete opposite. We don't care about uh, you know we don't care about your rights if you're not American. So. Like I said, there's a, there's a lot more into it than that, um, but I just wanted to kind of give you a better basic background on um, what is going on with the anti-imperialists. All right, so I couldn't finish the video yesterday, so I had to uh, do a costume change, and we're going to finish it now. So here we go, finishing up learning objective 3.2, uh, talking about America as a world power and kind of gaining an empire. Uh, so let's do it. So we're going to talk about Roosevelt first and some of the things that he did. I misspoke actually in the last part of the video. I, I said it was we're going to just talk about Wilson. Uh, I forgot that we have to talk about Roosevelt too. Anyway, so you know that Roosevelt uh, became president after McKinley was assassinated, and that's important because uh, McKinley started the whole like America as an empire thing 
with the Spanish American War. Uh, and and it, it had started before that, but, uh, that really got, got Americans going as far as, hey, we, we need to acquire new territory, um, you know, for naval bases to, for new markets, um, or to help other, other countries, uh, you know, understand why Christianity and, you know, the American way is the best way. So Roosevelt's going to continue this as uh, when he takes over as president, and he's really worried about Europeans uh, controlling the world economy and politics because, as I mentioned before, America's really late to the game. They are trying to play catch up, and that the best way to do that is going to be to you know, try to take, like, make, make sure you have a piece of the pie, or at least like, grabbing a piece of the pie, um, you know, or at least what's left of the pie, uh, right now. So like, we're, we're looking at places in Latin America, we're looking at, um, at places in, in the, mostly in the Pacific Ocean, and, uh, we're going to see what we can do. So the first thing that Roosevelt does is he's really known for is actually not, it's like kind of the opposite of empire building. He's actually helping create peace between Russia and Japan. So the Russo-Japanese War was taking place. Uh, they were disputing uh, control of Korea. So again, and you're not going to need to know that. I just, it's important to know kind of how Roosevelt is, uh, is, is progressing as president. So he uh, actually sits down with both of the leaders of, of Japan and Russia, and they negotiate the Treaty of Portsmouth. And Japan's going to get Manchuria and Korea, and Roosevelt's going to win the Nobel Peace Prize for that. It was, it was, he was the first president to do so, uh, which is a great accomplishment. It wasn't that big of a deal because it hadn't been around for that long uh, in 1904, but still a, a really, really awesome accomplishment for a president. And after that, the United States and Japan are going to kind of continue to have diplomatic relations. So we're going to say, hey, we'll, we're going to respect each other's possessions. We're not going to, like, for example, um, we had attained Hawaii by then. So Japan said, hey, Hawaii is off limits um, for us, uh, at least for now, until we get to World War II. Spoiler alert. Uh, but anyway, so that's that's important because Japan is a really powerful nation at this time, or they are are kind of rising up at this time uh, to become a powerful nation, just like America is. And so we're kind of negotiating with them to make sure that we're not going to get in each other's way. Uh, all right, so I wish I had more time to talk about the Panama Canal because the Panama Canal is truly a a marvel of the world. Um, the fact that it is. Uh, just so, I mean, it, it, it was such a gigantic project. Uh, the French actually started building it. They uh, had given up on it, though, because there was just people dying like crazy from disease and uh, and all kinds of, of construction. You, you know, you think about how, how, how big, I mean, Panama is a really tiny country, but they are literally building like a, they're building a river, a man-made river, essentially across like a 20, 30 mile stretch of uh like of land okay so i mean that's that's huge that would be like if we decided we were going to make a river from o'fallon or st peter's all the way to uh i don't know like like st louis city or beyond so that's a really big deal and that's interesting that they that this this is going to be huge for america um if we can make this happen and it does so here's the here's the deal. Uh, the United States wants the wants to build a canal to cut travel time uh, of commercial and military ships. Again, think about of the Navy and how important that is. Um, you need if your Navy's on one side of the ocean, if they're in the Pacific Ocean and you get attacked over in the Atlantic, you need a way to get them over there besides going all the way around like South like South America. So the canal is really going to help with that, and that's why we're I mean that's why we're we're trying to get it. Uh, also, it helps uh, commercially. Again, you talk about like you can think about merchant ships, or just um, you can send your if you have have products that you want to send uh, send places. Again, you are going to cut the travel time essentially in half uh, to get from New York to San Francisco. Uh, like again, a complete opposite sides of the country. Now you don't have to go all the way around South America. You don't have to take a train all the way across. Uh, you can just take a boat. And again, a train train could work, but it's not necessarily the most efficient. Uh, so the the boat is going to be um, is going to make that 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 travel time a lot easier to deal with. So anyway, I'm rambling. So 1901, the Hay Ponsfort uh, Treaty is going to give the United States exclusive rights to the canal. Um, the United States is going to buy the French company's uh, route through Panama. Uh, as I said, the Fran a, Fran a French company had started it, um, and then they gave up. 
The other thing that's interesting about the about this guys is that Panama um, was actually part of Colombia. So either, or Panama was a, a colony of Colombia, which is just to the south of Panama. And they we were trying to negotiate with Colombia to build the Panama Canal. Talks broke down and then we're like, well, we still want the canal. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to be like, hey, we're America. And we obtained our independence from a, a, a bigger nation or a more powerful nation. Why can't Panama do the same thing? So what's going to happen is we are going to kind of help out a Panamanian rebellion. And once the rebels actually win their revolution, uh, we are going to sign a treaty with them. And again, it's like, say, hey, we'll help you out. We're going to send troops or we're going to give you military aid in your, in your revolution. And it, when, you know, when you're done with the revolution, once you win, it would be really great if we could get this canal. Which is exactly what happens. So they, they sign a treaty. The United States is going to pay $10 million plus 250, uh, that should be 250,000. I'm missing a zero there, uh, per year for the canal zone. Uh, and this is a big deal because like, like you you the, the, yes, it sounds like a lot of money, but the reality is you're saving so much more money because of the, the, um, you know, the time you're saving, uh, the, the, the places you're going to be able to go. I mean, think about even just like in saving on fuel, you are cutting the travel time in half. You're going to have to sp like spend half as much on fuel. It, it's, it, there's a lot of benefits here. Um, again, the, as, as I mentioned, the canal is one of the greatest engineering feats. Um, there's horrible, like, geographic obstacles. They had to, like, cut through whole mountains sometimes, um, like, just blast them out. Uh, they had to fight a lot of diseases. At its height, there were, uh, like, around 43, uh, almost 44,000 workers employed working on the Panama Canal, constructing it. Uh, and then in 1914, the Panama Canal opens, uh, and then more than 1,000 merchant ships are going to pass through in the first year. Panama eventually will get this back. We will uh, give this back to them. Uh, because again, essentially, it's like the United States controls the, like, this, this part of another country, like, just in the middle. It's like this long strip right in the middle of Panama that the United, that is the United States. Uh, property. So I, I, again, we eventually will give it back to them. I believe it's in the seventies. I want to say, uh, don't quote me on that though. It's, it is, uh, somewhere later in the, in the later 1900s. Um, so t Teddy Roosevelt gets this, uh, he gets this, this notion of being known as like the, the, the constable or the world's constable. The constable is just another word for like a police officer. Um, and he is I, I, there before Roosevelt took over, like, like way earlier, like in the 1820s, uh, the president, president James Mon Monroe had issued a statement, um, that says that uh, Europeans need to stay out of Latin America. Now, in the 1820s, America didn't have the power to enforce that. That's what the, the Monroe Doctrine is, though. It says Europeans need to stay out of Latin America. America is going to, you the United States is going to protect Latin American countries from, uh, from European countries. Again, 1820, not really a big deal. That was just kind of, it was basically just like saying, Hey, we don't really have the power to do anything, but you should stay out anyway. Now, flash forward 80 years, we have the power to keep them out. So President Roosevelt is going to issue what's known as the Roosevelt Corollary. And this is going to basically be an addition to the Monroe Doctrine. And it says, it basically reminds them of the Monroe Doctrine, and it demands that they stay out of Latin America. Um, so it says that the United States would use force to protect their economic interests in Latin America uh, from Europeans. So like you see in the picture here, uh, again, on the left side, you have you have all of the Latin American countries or Latin American people. And then on the right side, you have all the Europeans. And then Teddy Roosevelt in the world, or I'm sorry, Teddy Roosevelt in the middle, who is kind of protecting, um, protecting Latin America from the Europeans. Again, this is just kind of showing you what the um, what the, you know, what the Roosevelt Corollary is doing. Uh, on a side note, uh, Roosevelt was known for a famous line that he said. He said, speak softly, but carry a big stick. Uh, and this, the, clearly in this picture, it, the, it says the new diplomacy, that is his big stick. The big stick is going to represent the military. Uh, so yes, you need to speak softly. You want to make sure you have good relations with other countries. However, you want to make sure that if push comes to shove, you've got what it takes to defend yourself, to uh, be able to win any battle that you need to. Uh, so that's the Roosevelt Corollary. Uh, dollar diplomacy is something that uh, that Taft actually uses 
afterwards. I don't believe that that's on uh, or that is on the test. I, I just want to make sure that you guys know about it uh, because there is a four year inter interlude between Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. So dollar diplomacy specifically, uh, it was in the early 1900s and it says that are like what they're going to do is they're going to exercise police power on several occasions. But specifically, the dollar diplomacy is to uh, it's going to be protecting our economic interests. So we are going to get involved in uh, and again, I know that like, I know it says that for the Roosevelt Corollary too. But the dollar diplomacy was much more focused on the economy. Um, in general, the Roosevelt Corollary was more about protecting Latin America and like you know just overall broadly. Uh, but dollar diplomacy was about making sure that our economic interests in Latin America were protected. Uh, and that was that was Taft's main thing. He also guaranteed it also guaranteed uh, foreign loans to U.S. businesses um, or sorry, foreign loans uh, by U.S. businesses. So if we if U.S. businesses had gone over um, to, and, and started started a, a new sector in uh, in a different country, they could still get loans. They could still make sure that they were were helping out the U.S. economy, um, even though they were in a different country. All right. So we're going to kind of I'm going to transition into into Wilson. Most of this is not on the test, but I want you I still want you to know what's going on because uh, we there are some tensions between, uh, you know, especially with immigration. There's some tensions with Mexico. Uh, and I think it's important to kind of know where that started or not, maybe not started, but at least a, a part of the story. So Woodrow Wilson is going to take a different approach to diplomacy. He's going to talk about uh, missionary diplomacy. Specifically, he believes that the United States has a moral responsibility um, to to help out uh, regimes that are going to, uh, or, or not not help out regimes, but to help out the people of the world. We don't want to necessarily just keep American Americans have a have a, a higher duty, a higher calling to make sure that we are are helping uh, you know helping people who are uh, who are struggling throughout the world. So again, they are not going to recognize regimes that are oppressive or undemocratic. So any dictatorships um, that are that are are you know taking rights away from the people, the United States won't recognize those. Um, and the, and this is the basic thing: is that, like the United States is going to kind of be the, the the moral leader of the world, and we are going to try to spread democracy throughout the world. That was the main thing. That might even be something that's good to add to missionary diplomacy: is that um, we want to we want to spread democracy, want to spread, um, you know, kind of American values, American beliefs uh, throughout the world. All right. So uh, the big thing that happens uh, before, well, the major thing that happens under Woodrow Wilson's presidency is World War I, uh, but we're getting to that next week. So the main thing to know before World War I is about the Mexican Revolution. So I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because, again, like I said, most of it isn't on the test, but it's good to know kind of what happened. And I wanted to give, give you guys some context as to kind of what America was doing um, with one of our neighbors. So, uh, under a guy named Perifrio Diaz, um, the United States was uh, in, investing a ton in Mexico, uh, talking about businesses, uh, just really trying. Like, remember, we're looking for new markets to sell our stuff, and uh, so Mexico was a, a really easy, uh, really easy market to access. So uh, he was a dictator, but he wasn't. He wasn't necessarily a bad dictator in the sense that uh, Americans weren't really, at least, at least. Wilson and and other American uh, people in American government weren't necessarily worried about the things that he was doing. So this is Perifrio Diaz at the top. Uh, moving down, the next guy uh, in 1911, peasants and and workers led by a guy named Francisco Madero, who is here, uh, they are overthrow Diaz. So again, it, it might be the sort of thing that uh, the 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 Diaz himself was not necessarily. Um, hurting all of the people. Uh, however, he might not have been providing as much for the poor. Uh, and that's because that's who led the rebellion against him. Anyway, moving on. After, so Madero takes over. Um, after that, uh, Gen General, uh, excuse me, General Victoriano Huerta uh, takes over the government. Madero is murdered. So this is Huerta as the third guy. And because of that, because of kind of the way that they, that Huerta took power, um, Wilson's not going to recognize him. He's going to say this is, they refuse to recognize Huerta's government. Um, and then we're just, we're kind of in this like weird stasis. Huerta wants to be recognized. He wants to have that, that kind of rebuild that relationship with America. Uh, but it doesn't happen. 
So after that, what's going to happen is there's an incident. Of course, there's always an incident. So there are uh, some U.S. sailors in uh, in Mexico uh, because Wilson will uh, do, because Wilson doesn't recognize um, Huerta's government. Uh, he arrests those U.S. sailors. He actually releases them really quickly. They realize it's probably not a good idea, uh, but it didn't matter. It was too late. So Wilson then ordered the Marines to occupy Veracruz, which is a city in Mexico, and uh after th- when that takes place like Argentina, Brazil, Chile are going to try to come in trying to mediate the situation uh to avoid war and both both of the state departments are going to sit down try to work it out and actually that didn't need to happen anyway because Huerta's regime is going to fall uh and then a nationalist by the name of Venustiano Carranza is going to become the new president um so you see him up here so Huerta's done they recognize uh, they, they recognize Carranza or Wilson will eventually recognize Carranza. Uh, but there's not, there's uh, some people that don't like him. So again, clearly like Mexico, Mexican government's not having, a, not having a, a good time right now because we've already been, I've said four different people that have been in charge of the government. So, um, there's a couple people that don't like Carranza, uh, specifically a guy by the name of Francisco, also known as Pancho, Pancho Villa, and then Emiliano Zapata. They are opposed to Carranza. Uh, Zapata wants land reform. He wants to make sure that peasants, basically he wants a redis- redistribution of land. What happened was most of the, the really wealthy people, they were in, they had most of the land. And then if you, uh, if you were a peasant or if you were a, a, like somebody who didn't have a lot of money, you had to work for them. Uh, so instead what Zapata wants is he wants it to be redistributed. Um, it's kind of a socialist idea or a communist idea and re- like redistribute the land, uh, so that like these peasants, instead of working for someone else, can actually work their own farms. And uh, Villa, though, he is a fierce nationalist. He uh, did not believe that uh, that Carranza was going to do a good job of representing Mex- Mexico's best interests. So anyway, what happens is uh, Villa is going to threaten uh, Wilson if uh, if he or he threatens Wilson if you recognize uh, Carranza's government, I am going to uh, do something bad. Wilson recognizes Carranza's government. Villa makes good on his threat. Um, he actually, there's a, a American miners that were, American engineers um, were traveling through Mexico. Villa captures them, kills them. Uh, he also raids Columbus, New Mexico. Uh, and in all in all, I think he kills about 133 people in that, in that general vicinity. Uh, it's a big deal. I mean, this is, we're talking about American citizens dying at the hand of uh, a Mexican citizen. So, you know, Americans are going to be very upset at this. So after that, what they're going to do is they're going to chase him. They never catch him. Just spoiler alert. I should have said spoiler alert early, earlier. Sorry. Um, anyway, so they, they, they enlist the help of a guy named John J. Pershing, uh, who's a general who is going to, uh, lead troops into Mexico to try to capture Villa. Um, Carranza demands the withdrawal of U.S. troops. Uh, Wilson at first is going to refuse this because again, they want to capture Villa. But so basically, like I said, we never capture Via, and that's a kind of a terrible end of the story, uh, especially when I tell you that uh, Via actually ended up getting assassinated like 10 years later. He just like he agrees eventually with Carranza to retire um, to just his his like, uh, his, like land in uh, in Mexico. And then Carranza probably ordered his his assassination and whoever whoever ordered it was eventually successful. Uh, but because the United States faced war in Europe, because war was happening in Europe, um, they want they want peace on the southern border. They don't want to have to worry about Mexico anymore because there's some bigger fish to fry across the Pacific or the Atlantic Ocean. So Wilson orders Pershing to come home. After that, Mexico adopts a new constitution uh, where the government's going to con- kind of is going to take control of more oil, of minerals, some things that uh, might have been in private hands before. Uh, they also are going to restrict foreign investors a little bit just to kind of keep make sure that like foreign interests aren't controlling the government. Um, and then, oh, and I'm sorry, it was actually, uh, it wasn't Carranza, I believe it was, uh, o- this guy, uh, Alvaro, uh, Obre- Obregadon, uh, Obre- Obregon, there we go, um, who is probably going to order, uh, Villa's assassination, uh, because he was, he was elected in 1920 and he didn't want, he wanted to make sure that Villa was not going to cause problems. Uh, so anyway, so that ends the Civil War. Uh, he's going to start re- kind of reforming Mexico, making it into, into a better place. Uh, but that's it. Um, so that'll take care of it. Guys, uh, if you have any questions, let me know in class. Uh, Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, 
catch you in the next one. Take it easy.